everyone, and welcome to episode 34 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. As we all know, the Middle Ages was not a time in which everyone looked or acted the same way, and it encompassed a whole world of people and ideas. So far on the podcast, we've kept most of our focus on Europe for logistical reasons. That is, I've been trying to keep up with the creation of a weekly podcast that's been way more successful than I ever dreamed, which means leaning heavily on the areas I've studied myself as I find my footing. My own focus of study has been England and France, so as I learn how to keep all the plates spinning in my own life, the podcast has had a focus on these areas too. But my vision for the podcast is for it to be more diverse, more global, and more wide-ranging, just like the real Middle Ages. So while it might still often have a Eurocentric bent, I want to bring you more than just Europe, and I hope to get better at that as time goes on. All this is to say that I am enormously pleased to bring you a podcast today that focuses on medieval Africa, especially its place in Islamic culture and international trade. Last week, I was lucky enough to get a preview of a new exhibit at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto called Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Art, Culture and Exchange Across Medieval Saharan Africa. The exhibit features 250 artifacts that span from the 8th to the 16th centuries, and they show the enormous wealth and exquisite craftsmanship to be found in Africa during the Middle Ages. My friends, there are pieces here on loan from collections all over the world, including some that have never left Africa before the exhibit's first incarnation. It's some really exciting stuff. After touring the exhibit, I sat down with the Aga Khan Museum's curator, Dr. Michael Chagnon. Michael is new to the Aga Khan, but definitely not new to Islamic art. He's a specialist in the art of Iran's early modern books and formerly the acting curator of Islamic art at the Brooklyn Museum. He also taught graduate students critical approaches to Persianate painting, a course he developed for Columbia University. We sat down to talk about the Aga Khan Museum, the exhibit, why it's important, and also some nerdy and fascinating Islamicist insights on how to figure out a ruler's reign. Well, thanks, Michael, for joining me to talk about the new exhibit at the Aga Khan Museum. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the Aga Khan Museum in general. Thank you for having me. Uh, The Aga Khan Museum is the only museum in North America devoted to Islamic civilizations. And the purpose of the institution is to think about the contributions of Muslim civilizations to world heritage and how... Uh, These contributions can help us understand how cultures have always been connected and can continue to be connected into the future. So what kind of things does someone see on a normal day, not looking at a special exhibition, but what kind of stuff do you see on a normal day at the Aga Khan? I don't know if there's a normal day at the Aga Khan Museum. We are an incredibly dynamic organization, and every day we have something new and exciting happening. From the moment you walk in through the door, we have performances, pop-up performances. We have installations in our in our lobby. Um, our facility itself is a work of art designed by Pritzker Prize-winning architect Fumihiko Maki. It's just an, a gorgeous facility. Uh, once you make your way through the slalom of culture that you get uh, immediately upon walking into the facility into the museum, uh, we have a, our permanent collection on view in our permanent collection gallery. Uh, these are works of, um, of art from the Islamic world spanning the 7th to the 19th centuries, and they are among some of the greatest masterworks of Islamic art. The foundation of the collection was that of a private collector, Sadruddin Aga Khan, and um, it comprises about 1,500 objects total. Uh, In the gallery, you'll see about uh, 200 on view at any point. And it's everything from manuscripts to bronze to pottery, all that kind of stuff, right? Absolutely. It's uh, across um, across media, across culture, uh, within the broad sphere of the of Islamic civilizations. So works on paper, manuscripts, paintings, drawings, uh, which really are some of the greatest achievements in, uh, in Islamic art history, but also fantastic ceramics, fantastic glasswork, inlaid metalwork, stone sculpture, architectural elements. Uh, we have a very, very broad and diverse collection. It's always a pleasure and the stuff here is so beautiful, but I am happy to have you here to talk today about your work 
work on uh, an exhibit about Africa. So tell us about the new exhibit that's running from September until February, all about Africa. Sure. The exhibition is called Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time. Uh, it's an exhibition that focuses upon uh, the centrality of uh, Western and Saharan Africa to the commerce and culture of the world during the global Middle Ages. And we're incredibly pleased to have been able to to be able to host this exhibition uh, from its originating institution at the Block Museum at Northwestern University. Right. And you've changed a few things about the layout that are new to the Aga Khan. So if you've even seen this exhibit at the Block Museum, it's worth visiting again, right? And you wanted to tell the story a little bit about the spread of Islam, the spread of Arabic into Africa. So why was this important to you to tell this story? Uh, we're, we're uniquely able, I think, at this institution to really um, highlight that portion of the exhibition that focuses on the interconnections between the spread of trade in the, uh, in the early Middle Ages, uh, starting in the 8th century, with uh, the spread of uh, Islam and Arabic into North Africa. So that sort of interdependence of these two phenomena, trade and, uh, let's say, cultural and religious spreading. It was important for us um, because I think it really shows how Islam in Africa made a great contribution to the world during this time. And that's a portion of, uh, of world history that's not normally told in classrooms, in textbooks. It's also not even told, I would say, by and large, uh, among specialists of Islamic civilization and, and Islamic art in particular. This, the story of Islam in Africa is really so overlooked in, in my field. And uh, I really, uh, I think it's a really wonderful opportunity to use, to seize this opportunity um, for the institution to tell that portion of the story. And as part of the Middle Ages, the trade that was really going on through uh, Saharan Africa uh, was mostly salt and gold. And you have that kind of central at the beginning. So what story did you want to tell about salt and gold here in the trade route? Sure. I, amongst the many, many diverse commodities that were traded across the Sahara and other circuits of trade in Western Africa as well, um, salt and gold were the most important. Gold really is the fuel of, um, of the economy across the world uh, at this time. And salt was just a life necessity. And so it was something that was very precious for people, especially in places where um, no salt existed or couldn't be mined, or if you weren't uh, along the seacoast. Uh, it was very important. It's a nutrient. It's something that we need to survive. And so the ability to exchange these two very important commodities uh, really drove the life of the Middle Ages uh, and uh, the, the role that the Saharan trade routes uh, played in that. It was absolutely critical. And one of the big stories that you tell about gold in the exhibition is about the richest man in the world. So can you tell us a little bit about the richest man in the world and his relationship to gold at this time? Sure. Um, a small portion of the exhibition focuses on the figure of uh, the, the king, the Mansa of the Mali Empire. His name was Musa, which is an Arabic word for Moses, actually. Uh, Mansa Musa in 1324 undertakes the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca uh, incumbent upon all Muslims at one point in their lives. He has a, a caravan of thousands of camels and courtiers. He brings magnificent riches with him along the way. His empire encompassed the, the gold fields of Western Africa, and so he had access to vast amounts of gold. Uh, and about three quarters of the way along uh, on his journey, he stops over in the great metropolis of Al Qahira in uh, Cairo and uh, then ruled by the Mamluk Sultanate. And it is said that he lavished so much gold upon Mamluk courtiers that he, in fact, depressed the value of gold in the city. Uh, this is, you know, maybe apocryphal, but it's a, it's a illustrative of the immense wealth that this man had. And it is said, it's estimated that he was the richest man that world history ever produced. Uh, so his story, I think, is illustrative of how important the regions under focus in this exhibition really were to world history. Yeah, and we've been talking about gold, and that's obviously a major part of the exhibition. But as you say, the trade didn't go just one way out of Africa and to Europe and other places, but it actually went back to Africa as well from places in Europe. And you have some of these examples in the exhibition. So you were talking about one 
that was specifically copper. So tell us a bit about copper. So amongst the great works that are on view uh, in this exhibition are uh, a group of bronze and copper sculptures that have uh, that are from uh, Nigeria and are housed in Nigerian museums that have not ever made their way to North America before until this exhibition. One of them is a seated figure, an absolutely gorgeous, naturalistically rendered seated figure uh, in copper. Uh, this beautiful shining copper that you absolutely must see in person. It's, you, words and pictures cannot do it justice. It's a 13th century sculpture of a seated figure, uh, and it shows a, a chemical analysis. Analysis of the, the metal itself demonstrates that the copper may have been sourced in the Alps. And so the idea that uh, commodities, that materials were not only making their way from Africa, such as gold and ivory, to European uh, markets uh, where they would be fashioned into panel paintings where they would be fashioned into sculpture. The trade actually went the other direction where artisans and patrons in Africa and medieval Western Africa were also using European goods to, to make incredible works of art. Uh, so I think it's that bilateral or multilateral exchange um, and interconnections that I think are very much highlighted in this exhibition and really tell the story that needs to be told. Yeah, absolutely. And I like the connectivity that you have, not just between cultures and between um, media in terms of making the art, but also between the past and the present. So you have a lot of examples, little fragments that you have from Africa, uh, from the Middle Ages, and then you've shown what they would look like by using modern examples. So a few of these are, well, a shield. Can you tell us about the shield? That was a really good one. Sure. Uh, there's this really incredible oryx hide. An oryx is a quadruped. An oryx hide shield uh, with beautiful metal and uh, textile decoration, leather decoration as well. It's rather large. It's about three-quarter human size. Uh, it has small bronze fittings on its surface. It's a 20th or late 19th or early 20th century object, um, but it can be correlated to a find from Mali, uh, an archaeological find, which are the, the very large bronze openwork disc, which one wouldn't necessarily know what it was produced for and, until you sort of put the pieces together and use uh, the originating curator, the curator of the exhibition, Kathleen uh, bickford Berzak at the Block Museum, what she terms uh, as the archaeological imagination, where you take a fragment of something found uh, in an archaeological dig and you're able to sort of correlate it to something either in textual sources or material wares from the present day. And from there you can sort of backtrack the story of how these objects were used. Uh, it's these sorts of ways that we take fragments from an archaeological excavation and open them up into, bring them into the flesh as it were for the present day. I think that it's a really effective and beautiful uh, series of objects that are shown in that portion of the exhibition. Yeah, one of the things that I was most excited about was the textiles. The fact that you have existing textiles is huge. It's amazing because there are, are not a lot of textiles that exist, and you have a series of them, which is kind of amazing. They exist, and they are fragments, um, but they really resemble the stuff that's still being made in Africa today. Now, why are these such a coup for the Aga Khan Museum? Uh, they're a coup for the exhibition in all of its manifestations at the block here at the Aga Khan Museum, and later um, the show will be traveling to uh, the Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C. I believe the, the fragments that you're referring to are known as the Telem textiles, um, after the Telem culture with which they're associated. Uh, they were found in uh, cave dwellings in Mali, and they're amongst the oldest textiles excavated from Africa. Africa. They not only show incredible high-level technique, which demonstrates that these weaving techniques were ancient by the time that these were produced between the 11th and 14th century, but they also they show the use of indigo dye, which again speaks to great circuits of trade. Uh, but as you as you pointed out, the technique of their manufacture also uh, links them to techniques that are continue that continue to be practiced in Mali and in other areas of Western Africa today. Uh, so we can tell this really long lineage through looking at these fragments from the past. We have other fragments on view as well, including Tiraz textile fragments, which are beautifully 
uh, embroidered silk uh, and beautifully woven, I should say, silk and um, sometimes gold thread textiles that were produced um, for for rulers to gift to other rulers or to to their subordinates. So uh, there are some really exquisite textiles on view in this exhibition. Well, I didn't realize until you told me today that those textiles are actually a way that you can use to date a rain. So tell us how they did that. Okay, well, this is very, very nerdy Islamicist sort of stuff. Uh, Tiraz textiles, uh, the word Tiraz uh, literally means embroidery. Um, It also is a term that is used to refer to the textiles um, produced in state factories, also known as Tiraz, where these uh, beautifully woven uh, silk and sometimes wool, sometimes cotton textiles are produced. They oftentimes include uh, inscriptions, which include a ruler's name and his date's Uh, in in a date of uh, the textiles manufacture. So when you read the inscriptions on Tiraz textiles, oftentimes we'll be able to piece together portions of history that otherwise are lost. Um, So we can tell the span of a ruler's reign. We can tell where his power extended, if it was made in the Tiraz of whichever city, and so on and so forth. Um, So they're very, very important uh, inscribed objects. Uh, So again, this is something that I think many people may find a bit obscure, but they're very, very exciting for (laughs) for those of us who focus on this, uh, this area of the world. Nerdy and obscure. That's our wheelhouse. It's a medieval podcast. You're my people. You're my people. (laughs) Exactly. And that's why we're here. So the textiles were some of my favorite parts of the exhibition. Um, Also, you know, you have some bits of jewelry which are which are amazing to have here because they are very rare. They're intact, which is amazing. What are some of your favorite pieces at the exhibition? I mean, it's hard to make you choose, right? But what are some of your favorite pieces here? I haven't had time to actually sit back and think about that question quite yet. I will say that we we lavished a lot of time on the very opening of the exhibition. We have a series of gold coins that you know they're they're coins. You know how they're gold, but they're they're coins. So you 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 think about how to to entice viewers to uh, and visitors to the museum uh, into these very important historical objects that are actually quite beautiful when when shown in the right way. And I think we've managed to execute a really gorgeous display of these coins just in particular uh, so that when you walk into the exhibition you're confronted with something that's quite unexpected. Um, I'm not going to give it away but it's something quite unexpected and quite beautiful. So do come to the museum and uh, have that experience. Well, I would certainly encourage everybody to come to the museum and see this because it's something that you need to see for yourself. And as someone who hasn't had a lot of experience with actually curating anything, I liked how you have, you've created a path for people to come across really important objects that tell the story as they go. And it's not just coins, but it's also manuscripts and other pieces like that. So what, what do you hope that people will get out of coming to this exhibition? What are the ideas that you're hoping that they will come away with? I think uh, a couple big ideas. The first is really to understand how uh, medieval Africa was uh, really central, again, to the, the cultural life and the commercial life of the broader global Middle Ages. Um, so really to undo a lot of misperceptions about Africa, but also to undo a lot of misperceptions about the Middle Ages. Uh, that's one. Uh, the bigger picture, of course, is that we always hope at this institution to think about how cultures have always been connected and how we continue to be connected in this world. Uh, If we can tell that story in little ways, uh, in big ways, then we've done our job. And uh, I don't think that there's any other institution in the world that's really so wholeheartedly devoted to that mission. Uh, So please do come and visit us. I would encourage everyone to come and visit you. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you again. Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time opened this weekend and will be running at the Aga Khan Museum from now until February 23, 2020. For more information on the museum or the exhibit, you can visit agakhanmuseum.org. That's A-G-A-K-H-A-N museum.org. Or you can follow the museum on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Well, we, we were also at the uh, Aga Khan Museum for the Caravans of Gold uh, exhibition, so you can read a bit about that in Medievalist.net. Uh, we also have got a lot of actually pieces, uh, really kind of diverse stuff, so you can read about the Shroud of Turin, Eleanor of Aquitaine, early medieval art, 
uh, PhD dissertation that was turned into a comic. And finally, there's a project where you can actually help transcribe a medieval manuscript. So if you check out the site, you can find out all the details on that. So yeah, Peter, you were at uh, the Aga Khan Museum with me. What did you really like? I was talking to Michael about really liking the textiles. What was something that stood out for you? One of the things I really enjoyed and was surprised was how much connected Africa was with the rest of the medieval world. We have kind of uh, pieces that kind of originate in China and Switzerland and even England uh, that come to Africa. And uh, so those were really interesting to kind of see those connections. And I just really loved uh, the kind of statues, uh, there the figures of, there's a figure of a bowman, a figure of an elephant. Uh, they were just outstandingly beautiful. So I, there was a lot of kind of stuff there that really surprised me that kind of comes out as incredibly beautiful and just a lot to learn about. Yeah. And you've, you've actually posted some pictures on the website, right? So people can, can get a taste of that by going to medievalist.net. Uh, we already put up some stuff and we will put up in the next over a few weeks. We'll have some more uh, things to share on Instagram. Sounds awesome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, my own work is on medieval Europe, and you can read a whole bunch of it in my new book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction. I wrote it to answer all sorts of the real human questions that come up when we encounter the Middle Ages, like what did people eat, and did they ever get to choose who they married? It's available for pre-order all over the world, and while the UK gets it next week, September 30th, it'll be out in Australia in November, Canada in December, and the United States in January. This is the last episode that'll come out before the book comes out, so wish me luck. I hope you like it. For all sorts of medieval trivia, as well as some serious scholarship, you can follow Medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist, and you can find Life in Medieval Europe, as well as my other books, on Amazon. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thank you to the Aga Khan Museum for the sneak peek, and thanks for listening. Have yourself a great day.